Between the shadows of reality and the fringe of our own fears lurks a world of monsters. Strange creatures and frightening phantoms who test the very boundaries of our science and superstition. It's a realm of mystery and legend, a place of fact and fear. This is Monstro Bizarro. July 1970. Darkness engulfed the serene countryside of eastern Georgia as two men prepared to do some night fishing on the Altamaha River. Donnie Manning and his brother were longtime residents of the Peach State, where they enjoyed fishing in the estuaries and inland waters of the impressive waterway. Altamaha has a certain mystique with its deep waters and vast banks. It was a place familiar to the men where they could forget the bustle of the city in its calm currents that flowed eastward toward the Atlantic. On this particular night, the brothers were fishing from their father's houseboat. They had rigged up some lights to illuminate one side of the boat where they could sit back and relax as they fished. They were hoping to catch some trophy catfish using a special bait that consisted of oatmeal and soda pressed onto a three-pronged hook. Manny dropped the first hook into the water and sat back to wait. It wasn't long before something tugged at his line. He was excited by his quick luck, for a moment at least. As the line began to move, he noticed it was not the typical run-stop-turn motion of a catfish. He tightened the grip on his rod. Suddenly, the line zipped forward with a great force. Donnie yanked the rod backwards. This caused the thing at the end of the line to surface long enough for the brothers to get a good look at it in the floodlights. This was definitely not a catfish, gar, or even a sturgeon common to the river. This thing was approximately 12 feet long with grayish skin and a head similar to an alligator. I've never seen anything like it. This thing had a horizontal tail instead of a vertical one like a fish, and it had a spiny kind of bony triangular ridge along the top of its body. The teeth were shining in the light, and they were sharp and pointed. It was gunmetal gray on top, oyster of white yellow on the bottom. It didn't move side to side like a snake, but up and down in a vertical motion. Whatever this was, it was very bizarre looking. Manny fought with the creature as it pulled the line of his sturdy saltwater rig, but he was no match. The creature splashed and thrashed before it eventually snapped the 40-pound test line and disappeared into the depths of the Altamaha. Manny and his brother were shaken. They had never encountered anything like it. Donnie had lived along the swampy waters of the Altamaha for most of his life and was familiar with just about every kind of aquatic life the river had to offer. What he and his brother saw that night simply wasn't normal. I just kept thinking, what the hell's living in this river? Greetings, aficionados of monstrous mysteries. Welcome to Monstro Bizarro. I'm your host, Lyle Blackburn, and on this episode we'll be taking a boat ride along the Altamaha River of Georgia, where a long history of unexplained sightings suggests that some kind of strange aquatic species may be undulating through its waters. It's a place I've explored myself and one whose mystery monster has become something of a local legend in and around the small town of Darien, located in far eastern Georgia, near the Atlantic coast. The creature known as the Altamaha Ha, or Alti for short, has primarily been reported along the tributaries associated with the Altamaha's coastal estuary, but occasionally also further inland. It's been described as something reminiscent of the Loch Ness Monster, although it's said to be more snake-like with a long, dark body mostly devoid of fins. Alleged sightings date back to the seafaring days of yore, and have continued to the present day. So don your life jackets and grab your best nets, 
as we attempt to find what lurks in the waters of the Altamaha River. The strange encounter with a rather unique aquatic creature reported by Donnie Manning is but one of many logged over the years, many by very credible witnesses who in some cases have been fishing the area for a long time. The creature's moniker, the Altamaha Ha, is an obvious tongue-in-cheek name owing to skeptics who undoubtedly question its existence. But that's normal for any cryptid case, and we should be skeptical while never losing an open mind about what might be lurking, or in this case swimming, on the fringe of known catalogued species. The Altamaha River itself is a wide and twisting body of water that cuts an unassuming path through miles of floodplain forests, swamps, salt marshes, and sparsely populated areas of eastern Georgia, where natural ecosystems flourish in hidden domains. It's one of the most important natural features along the southeastern coast, providing both a substantial river channel for drainage and a network of swampy inlets and tributaries where abundant plants and wildlife can flourish. Located entirely within Georgia's boundaries, the Altamaha drains eastward from its origin near Lumber City to the Atlantic Ocean near the small town of Darien. Its route covers more than 130 straight-line miles with a floodplain that engulfs approximately 14,000 square miles, making it one of the largest river systems on the Atlantic coast. Its massive volume, which pours 100,000 gallons of water into the ocean every second, ranks it as North America's third largest contributor of fresh water to the Atlantic Ocean. With those credentials, perhaps it's not surprising that it may be host to an unexplained creature. The first sighting of a possible unknown creature in the Altamaha waters was recorded by both the Charleston Mercury and Savannah Georgian newspapers in April 1930. The witness was a trader by the name of Captain Delano, who often made runs between the towns of Charleston and Brunswick. Delano claimed that while he was sailing in his schooner, he saw a strange animal swimming near St. Simmons Island below the mouth of the Altamaha. The reporter from the Savannah Georgian who spoke to Delano personally, said he described it as being about 70 feet long and its circumference about that of a sugar hogshead, moving with its head, which was shaped like an alligator's, about 8 feet out of the water. A hogshead is a large wooden cask or barrel used to transport liquid or dry goods such as sugar. Following Delano's sighting, Several plantation owners on St. Simmons Island reported seeing a huge, dark animal swimming in the same area on multiple occasions. They described it as being between 40 and 60 feet long, with the ability to roll over like a porpoise and spit or spew water into the air. It left a considerable weight behind it as it swam, and on at least one occasion it was seen alongside a smaller creature, presumably an offspring. The men viewed it both with and without a telescope. A former sea captain who had seen it along with the other men felt it could have been a grampus whale. Either way, it was impossible to say whether it was the same thing seen by Delano, who maintained that what he saw was definitely not a whale. Delano told a reporter from the Charleston Mercury he was familiar with all types of whales, but had only seen a, quote, monster similar to the one at St. Simmons Island on one other occasion. In this case, he was at Doughboy Sound, a body of water that separates Sapello Island from the mainland and connects to the Altamaha River. For nearly half a century following these reports, sightings were either rare or rarely reported, as there seems to be a significant quiet period. However, that would all change when a dramatic sighting made big headlines in the early 1980s. On a warm day in December 1980, Larry Gwynn and Steve Wilson headed out to do some eel fishing in a tributary of the Altamaha, located about 15 miles inland from the Atlantic. 
As the men were fishing, they caught sight of something rising through the brackish water not far from their boat. It was not uncommon to see huge bass or even a sturgeon on the move, but this was not a normal fish, if a fish at all. It appeared to be snake-like with a brown-colored body about 15 to 20 feet long. According to the men, it was as big around as a man's body with two brownish humps about five feet apart. The fishermen watched the odd creature for several moments until it finally dove with a big swirl of water. The sighting was so unusual that Gwen, who was a former newspaper publisher, made an official report to the press. The story was initially published in the local news, but was quickly picked up by the national press, where it made quite a stir in early 1981. Could a creature like the Loch Ness Monster be hiding in the waters of the Altamaha? It would have seemed like a far-fetched proposition, if not for the string of credible witnesses who began to come forward with equally intriguing tales. Two of these were Barry Prescott and Andy Green. About six months before Gwen and Wilson saw something, Prescott and Green were driving along Highway 95 near the town of Darien when they caught sight of a very odd creature on the bank of Cathead Creek, a coastal tributary of the Altamaha. The creek was rather shallow at the time due to the low tide, and the thing appeared to be stranded on the muddy ground. The men watched as it thrashed around, apparently trying to get itself back into the water. The creature was so odd they pulled off to get a better look. They could see it was dark in color with rough-looking skin. It was approximately three to four feet thick and at least 30 feet long based on what they could see extending out of the water, which was about 20 feet of the creature. They did not see any humps, only a triangular-looking section on the lower part of its body. Its movement was powerful and undulating, rather than the back-and-forth swimming movement of common marine life. After about 10 minutes, the thing finally freed itself from the bank and sank into the water without any further disturbance. Harvey Blackman of Brunswick, Georgia, was fishing from a floating dock on the Altamaha at a location called Two-Way Fish Camp when he was rocked by a sudden wave. The startled fisherman looked down to see a grayish-brown monstrous something about 15 to 20 feet long and as big around as a man's torso. As it swam by, it raised its head above the surface for a moment. Its eerie visage looked like a snake head. Around the same time period in 1981, another witness reportedly saw a strange aquatic animal just south of Two-Way Fish Camp. The witness, who requested privacy, told author and historian Ann Davis he and a friend were paddling along in a small boat when they saw something lying on the mud bank up ahead. At first, they thought it might be an alligator, but as they approached, it became apparent it was not. The thing was about 12 to 15 feet long and almost 2 feet in diameter with grayish-brown skin. They immediately thought of the recent news reports concerning the alleged Ultima Ha Ha and thought perhaps they were seeing it for themselves. As they attempted to get closer, the animals slid back into the water and proceeded to swim right by their boat. The men could now see what appeared to be two or three humps on its body as it undulated through the water. They could not see any fins or any appendages. It looked snake-like, but was not a snake or an eel. Frank Culpepper, the owner of Two-Way Fish Camp, cited another incident in which three men spotted a big snake-looking creature one day near the camp's dock. Culpepper said he was inside a building when one of the men rushed in and told him to grab a rifle and get outside as fast as he could. Culpepper hurried outside with the rifle, but by then, whatever it was had disappeared into the murky water. Culpepper may have just missed it at the camp, However, he did experience a startling encounter with something while fishing upriver. He was sitting in his boat when something slapped the side with significant force. Culpepper looked down to see a thick, long, brownish creature moving in the water. It seemed as though it was trying to get in the boat. 
It scared me so badly I cranked the boat and went back to the camp. It looked like a big snake, he said. As the 1980s progressed, so did the growing case file for Alti. Not long after the first news stories broke, rumors circulated that a Boy Scout troop had encountered a strange creature in the swampy tributaries back in the 1940s. Officials at the Reedsville State Prison were said to have seen an unidentified creature in the 1950s. Kathy Strickland believes she saw Alti sometime around the late 1970s as she was driving across the Champney Bridge, which passes over inland portions of the Altamaha's winding path. As she looked towards the river, something unusual caught her eye. It was partially above the surface, just idling in the water. It was dark in color like an eel, with a long neck, small head, and two distinct humps along the back. She said it was prehistoric looking, yet very natural in appearance and not a man-made item or a fish simply floating in the water. She estimated it was at least 20 feet in length and as big around as a person. Incidents picked up again when the Darien News reported a dramatic new sighting in 1983. A car salesman named Tim Sanders said he was driving across the same Champney Bridge on the afternoon of January 16th when he spotted what he thought to be a porpoise playing near the riverbank about a hundred yards away. Sanders pulled over to observe. As he watched, he realized it was not a porpoise, but some kind of unusual creature. He was awestruck. It appeared to be about 25 feet in length and about three feet in width. Its skin was dark and it had several humps about six to seven feet apart along its back. The thing that threw me is I've never seen a fish that big, Tim told the reporter. He conceded it could have been a sturgeon, but in his opinion, sturgeons never looked or swam like that. In the summer of 1985, Isaac Bacon was fishing with his brother and sister in a tributary of the Altamaha known as Dense Creek when they noticed something laying on the muddy bank. It was low tide, so the bank was visible more than usual. The trio couldn't decide if it was a living creature, such as an alligator, or perhaps a partly submerged tire. Suddenly, it moved. Bacon told researcher Ann Davis that it blew water out of its nostrils and then entered the water and began swimming up the creek. It eventually swam towards their boat, giving them a better look. According to Bacon, it was 12 to 14 feet long and as big around as a man's body, with skin the color of dark mud. They could see no gills, fins, or appendages. The creature was definitely snake-like. The trio was so shaken they quickly boated away from the area. Darien News detailed a credible report in their May 26, 1988 edition. Veteran crab fisherman Ralph DeWitt said on the afternoon of May 13th he had just checked his crab traps in Doughboy Sound near the Altamaha when he spotted what appeared to be trash wrapped around a crab buoy. Curious, DeWitt steered toward it. When he got within about 40 feet, he realized it was actually something alive. Whatever it was suddenly dipped into the water. The fisherman watched as the thing's blackish-brown body arced up out of the water and then dove back in, followed by its head like a serpent. It appeared to be at least 20 feet long. When the creature did not re-emerge, DeWitt navigated into the river channel and started working traps. He was still spooked by the encounter, so all the while he kept looking back to the spot where he'd seen it. Finally, after about 10 minutes, he saw the thing's head break the surface again. He dropped the traps and began motoring slowly in its direction. When he got within 50 feet, the thing dipped its head into the water, followed by the roll of its sleek-looking body above the surface, and then dove again. It's like nothing I'd ever seen before, affirmed DeWitt, who had been harvesting crabs in the area for more than 14 years. I've seen manatees, sturgeon, tarpon, turtles, porpoise, and logs, but I have never seen anything like this. 
DeWitt said it was similar to an eel, but considerably larger. He could only wonder what kind of beast may be lurking just under the surface as he resumed his work. He remained nervous the rest of the day, but never saw it again. According to another report from the Darien News, a strange creature was seen yet again near the Champney Bridge on December 18, 1992. Scotty Rogers told reporters he was driving across the bridge when he noticed a disturbance in the waters of the Altamaha below. At first, he thought it might be a school of fish, but then, quote, a big thing looking like a tractor-trailer inner tube standing on its end started coming out of the water and looked like it came out at least eight feet. When more of the creature emerged, it looked to be upwards of 30 feet in total length. Rogers said the creature was a brownish-gray in color and had a very broad circumference. He could not see its head, but he had no doubt this was a unique animal, if in size alone. Like many of the witnesses, Rogers had years of fishing experience in the Altamaha area. He had never seen anything like it. And that seems to be the consensus. Whether it was an unknown creature or one that was extremely rare and unusual, it was something no one could identify. As sightings of Alti continued in the coming decades, it firmly established the creature as part of the local culture, particularly in the small town of Darien where reports tended to cluster. Darien was established in 1736 and still retains a certain old world maritime charm with its picturesque landmarks, boat docks, and seafood restaurants. It seems only natural that a mysterious water creature would be part of the regional traditions. I visited Darien several years ago with my longtime research partner Cindy Lee as we were exploring the case of the Altamaha River Monster. The first cultural sign of the legend we noticed was a huge billboard above the Darien Visitor Center which has an artist's rendition of the creature. Inside the visitor center, we found a fantastic museum-quality replica of Alti, created by artist Rick Spears. Spears based his design on witness descriptions, resulting in an impressive piece that really brings the legend to life. The center also provides information on local attractions, including a nice brochure on the subject of Alti. You can even buy a few Alti-related souvenirs there. The creature's similarity to the Loch Ness Monster cannot go unnoticed, and perhaps there's a strange bit of irony here since Darien was founded by Scottish Highlanders from the very shores of Loch Ness. According to official records, the original settlers were recruited at Inverness, Scotland in 1735. Inverness is situated at the mouth of the River Ness, which flows from the legendary loch. The Highlanders even called their budding settlement New Inverness before changing its name to Darien. You just can't make this stuff up. During our visit, Cindy and I explored areas along the Altamaha River where sightings have been reported. At each spot, we sat for a while gazing at the vast water and contemplating the possibility of the creature's reality. We had a video camera in hand, of course, just in case we spotted something. We did see a huge alligator in the river, but it was easy to identify and not easily mistaken for an unknown animal. Back in 2010, a man shot some interesting video footage off the banks of the Fort King George historic site. Something large, which he believed might have been the creature, can be seen swimming in the Altamaha. But ultimately, in viewing this footage, it's hard to say just what it is. The mysterious creature continues to stir up news reports. In March 2018, I got a call from First Coast News out of Jacksonville, Florida, asking me to comment on a photo of a strange carcass that had washed up on a beach in southeast Georgia. The photo, which had surfaced on the internet a day earlier, appeared to show the decaying body of an unknown marine animal that matched the descriptions of Alti. According to WSB-TV Atlanta, a man named Jeff Warren spotted the deceased animal while boating with his son around Golden Isles, Georgia. 
Warren said he first thought the creature was a dead seal, but upon closer inspection realized it was more of a so-called, quote, Loch Ness type thing. With its long snake-like body, people were quick to surmise that it may be a dead Altamaha specimen. There was nothing in the photo, however, to provide scale. But at any size, it certainly does resemble the collective image we have of the Altamaha River monster. I told the news reporter that I would be thrilled if it were an unknown species, but without speaking to the individual who supposedly discovered it, and better yet, examining the carcass myself, it's hard to say just what it is. It looked promising, but there was little I could glean from a single photo whose origin was unsubstantiated. I tried to find out what happened to the supposed carcass, but I was never able to track it down. As in so many of these mysterious photos that supposedly show cryptids, it's often hard to determine if it's a real creature, a hoax, or merely an illusion created by the decaying body of a common marine animal. Ultimately, it remains a mystery. That sound means it's time to answer some listener mail. I have one here from Rain Beckett. How did you find your calling to be a cryptid hunter, and how did your family take the news? Well, naturally, they were extremely shocked. Well, I mean, not really. All of this started at a very early age for me because of my interest in quote-unquote monsters. I was first introduced to movie monsters and then later to cryptids. At first it was Bigfoot, Yeti, the Loch Ness Monster, but that expanded when I started reading books about sightings of sea serpents and other strange phenomenon. I just loved any kind of mystery involving spooky, unexplained things, so cryptids fit right into that. Later, I saw the 1970s movie The Legend of Boggy Creek, and that really did it for me. This wasn't some cryptid that lived in Scotland or the Pacific Northwest. This was some kind of unexplained ape-like thing that was terrorizing people in southern Arkansas, very close to where I lived, and still do, in Texas. That sort of combined cryptids and movie monsters into one wild story, so it became my favorite movie and my favorite subject. Later in life, when I decided to write a book, I wanted to write it on the subject of The Legend of Boggy Creek, the making of the movie and the history of sightings of the creature itself. So I researched for several years and wrote the book. After I got a publishing deal and it was released, I got such a great response that I wanted to continue doing it. So I set out to research new cases and write more books. I never consciously set out to be a cryptid hunter or even expected to be known as one, since I was really just researching and writing about things I liked. I joined a punk band when I was in 10th grade, and I've been a musician ever since. I've written for horror magazines and all sorts of stuff, so when I started doing serious cryptid research, my family didn't really react at all. I mean, this was normal fare for me. They were just mainly proud that I got a book published and that it was selling well. But they really do appreciate these subjects, and my dad is also interested in cryptids, so it's nice to have their support on this stuff. When I first joined a punk band at 16 years old, well, not so much. Thanks for the great question, so keep them coming. And if you've sent one and I haven't gotten to it yet, hopefully I can soon. Or perhaps I can do a show dedicated solely to audience questions in the future. Do monsters dwell among us, or are these figments of our imagination? Embodiments of our collective fears, neatly categorized and given a face so that we may manage them more effectively? Or are there things about this world that we simply do not understand? Or vast oceans that may yet hold secrets so shocking it confirms the existence of unknown beasts? Beasts who occasionally navigate the tributaries that lead inland to us. Whatever people are seeing along the Altamaha River appears to be extraordinary. The description of an extremely long snake-like body 
horizontal fins or a lack of fins, and a head that resembles an alligator but not an alligator does not match any particular type of marine animal indigenous to the Atlantic coast. It seems like whatever it is hasn't previously been identified, whether it's an inhabitant of the Altamaha River or something that has gained access via the sea. Skeptics are quick to point out that sightings could be attributed to an unusually large sturgeon, a fish that does in fact populate the Altamaha. Others suggested a manatee. West Indian manatees migrate to the Altamaha estuary in the summer, so perhaps one of these has been exploring the tributaries inland. Others believe Alti may be a stray dugong, porpoise, seal, or an oversized eel. Some even suggest Alti is merely a conglomeration of river otters. Otters are known to swim in groups, and when doing so in a straight line, it may appear to be a solid, contiguous form. Yet others lean toward an alligator gar, a large fish that truly does look prehistoric. If the eyewitness descriptions are accurate, it's hard to imagine a manatee, dugong, porpoise, seal, otters, or even an alligator would be confused with something that has a much more elongated snake-like body, one that is estimated to be in excess of 20 feet long. An extremely large eel might fit the bill, but it seems most people would recognize an eel, regardless of size. An alligator gar seems to be the most reasonable culprit with its slender body and alligator-like mouth, yet many of the witnesses are fishermen who would have been familiar with this type of fish. The alligator gar, which can grow up to 10 feet in length, has noticeable scales and a pair of fins near its head, characteristics that were not given in the Alti descriptions. And in most cases, the Altamaha River monster was said to be much longer than a common alligator gar. The fact that the Altamaha River can be accessed by the sea gives the phenomenon a credibility your average landlocked aquatic legend does not have. Even though a marine animal coming in from the ocean would not be indigenous to fresh water, it's not out of the question. Sharks have been known to travel a surprising distance up a river. Why couldn't something else? Perhaps Alti is a so-called sea serpent, like those that inspired many a sailor's tale, or a prehistoric relic that is not actually extinct. In 1938, fishermen off the coast of South Africa reeled in a bizarre-looking fish that turned out to be a coelacanth. The discovery was shocking, since the coelacanth was thought to have gone extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period, over 66 million years ago. Perhaps Alti is not a serpent, a.k.a. reptile, at all, but the descendant of an ancient whale such as the Bacillosaurus. This prehistoric whale had a long, eel-like body with vertebrae that were filled with marrow. Because of this, the whales were buoyant, which means Bacillosaurus probably swam predominantly at the surface, which is similar to the descriptions of sea serpents and the Altamaha River monster. But would a whale venture so far into fresh water? As residents along the Altamaha debated the possibility, historians suggested that perhaps sightings of a strange beast in the river were not exclusive to modern times. The Tama Indians of the area had a legend of a water monster described as a giant snake which hissed and bellowed when frightened. The Creek Indian tribes of the southeast believed an aquatic snake with exceptional strength lived in the rivers and creeks of the area. Stories like these were told to early American explorers who recorded them in their travel journals. Though no one could say for sure, perhaps these stories had been based on sightings of something large and snake-like lurking in the very waters of the Altamaha. While investigating the case, Cindy and I traveled further up the river where we could access a more remote spot on its wild banks. There we trudged through the reed grass and trees, marveling at the network of soggy channels covered in carpets of avocado-colored duckweed. Cindy noticed an alligator moving through one of the weedy offshoots. It watched us with two wary eyes peering above the surface of the water. 
Wildlife along the river was plentiful, and perhaps dangerous if one were to take a misstep. When we reached the bank, we found the remains of an old weathered pier. We used it as a vantage point to survey the river, which spanned a good distance across and as far as we could see in either direction. The enormity of the Altamaha Basin could only be imagined. This small section seemed vast enough, let alone the miles and miles of watery terrain that stretched further inland. It placed the phenomenon in perspective. Cindy and I both agreed anything could be out there in the depths of its dark waters. Is there a unique and strange creature living in the Altamaha? Perhaps only time will tell. As new sightings continue to surface, perhaps someday a body will too. The body of a creature that can be examined and verified by science. However, just because it hasn't been verified doesn't mean it's not out there. If you find yourself on the shores of the Atlantic coast near the mouth of the mighty Altamaha, or in a boat at night far inland, keep your eyes on the ripples in the dark water. It could be the first indication of a huge snake-like thing making its way towards you. A thing that swims both in our world and in the vast realms of Monstro Bizarro. For more information, visit my website at lyleblackburn.com.